Uh, it's a personal honor, a pleasure and a professional honor to introduce today's speaker. We've been good friends since going back to our grad school days at the University of Michigan. I think Steve and I were probably two of the most boring graduate students in our cohort. Since then, he's come a long way, and he is the Harris Professor of Archaeology at the University of Virginia, where he has spent most of his professional career. As a native of El Paso, he got a stellar start in archaeology at Paul Martin's Vernon Project, where he was the official dishwasher. Since then, he has worked in a variety of places in the Southwest, things like Chevron and Black Mesa and Chaco Canyon. I think he has really three major contributions that people recognize. The first is the work he's done with ceramic theory and practice. Uh, second of all, he's published uh, one of the major summaries of South and useful summaries of Southwest archaeology, ancient peoples of the American Southwest, which has been very, very popular. And more recently, his innovative Chaco archive is uh, really an amazing uh, resource on the internet of everything Chaco. He and his students have spent a great deal of time digitizing and put up uh, a basically a, a, a digital library of Chaco, things that would not be available otherwise or easily available to scholars. It really is probably one of, it's probably the most important digital or in, in the first digital humanities archive for Southwest and Northwest archaeology. Because of these major contributions. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2007, and he's right now only one of two living archaeologists, Patty Crown being the other, who are members of the National Academy of Sciences. He, in 2015, was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So he's had a stellar career, and his career has been recognized by the highest honors that really a, a scholar can, uh, an archaeologist can get. So we all want to uh, join me in uh, welcoming Steve and hearing what he has to say about Chaco. Uh, hello to everyone from Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, I trust you've had better weather than we have today where the temperatures didn't get out of the 30s and we had mixed rain, sleet, and occasional snow. Um, I want to begin tonight um, with a short aside from the lecture. Um, and sadly note the passing last week of Gwen Vivian. Um, Gwen Vivian was simply an amazing person in any number of ways. Uh, no one knew more about Chaco than Gwen. His father was an archeologist archeolo for the Park Service, spent most, much of his time in Chaco. Gwen spent much, much of his youth in Chaco then continued his research there. Um, I think it's fair to say Gwen's heart never left Chaco. Um, beyond Gwen's extraordinary scholarship, he was uh, an outstanding mentor to any number of people. He was an outstanding colleague. He was an outstanding friend. Um, it would be hard for me to name someone who was kinder, nicer, warmer than Gwen. And, um, you know, it's a tremendous loss uh, that he's, he's passed. So I just wanted to mention that before moving on. This picture is, was taken in 2006 and in a lot of ways it typifies Gwen to me. Uh, I had taken a group of Virginia students out to Chaco in January, and Gwen agreed to join us, and he's giving a tour of uh, Kinviniola to uh, the students who, who came, came out with me. Um, and I, I honestly have never seen uh, students react to someone this way. I mean, they, they treated Gwen like he was a rock star. I mean, he just wowed them in any number of ways. So uh, again, a very, very sad thing to comment on, but fortunately Gwen lived a long and productive life uh, and his life's work on Chaco water and Chaco ag agriculture um, has been submitted to University of Utah Press 
uh, and hopefully we'll be out within the next year, year and a half. Um, I wish Gwen had lived to see that, um, but I'm thrilled that it has been submitted. So let me move on and begin tonight's lecture. Um, I'm gonna talk about a variety of different things. Um, you know, I don't, I, as Paul mentioned, I've spent much, most of my career working on small sites in Chevalon and Black Mesa, uh, sites that my, my wife is fond of saying um, when I would take her out and show them to her that she never could see the sites. Whereas in Chaco, you can't miss them. So part of the time I was about 50, I don't think I had stepped in Chaco Canyon more than twice. Um, but as I read more and more, particularly of Gwen's work, I became more and more intrigued by the canyon and, and began to turn my research um, toward issues re related to um, what was happening in the Chaco region. So um, as I said, I, I don't focus on a particular um, set of evidence. I don't have a, a, a set interpretation of Chaco that I'm gonna present, but I'm gonna cover a variety of issues that I think are important and need to be considered in any discussion of Chaco. So this is the, the standard view you see of Chaco great houses in the canyon. Um, it's about a nine mile stretch of the canyon. Uh, there, there are definitely uh, other great houses nearby. There's some great houses in, in the canyon that are not actually shown on this map. Um, but although Chaco, the canyon looks like a dry, arid, uh, landscape and in, in many ways that what it is today. Um, it looked very, very different uh, prehistorically. And I think that's one of the things that, that Gwen's research ha has, has documented. Um, in addition to the canyon, Chaco had a broad influence over a very broad swath of the Southwest up to Southwestern Colorado southeastern Utah, northeastern Arizona. Uh, there are Chaco great houses spread over that area. Uh, Chaco great houses are, or great kivas. Uh, there are Chaco roads that you've, you've heard about recently. Um, so Chaco is, is undoubtedly unique in, in many ways in the, the, magnitude, the, the, the magnitude of, of the, the great houses in the canyon some of the largest sites, pre-1300 uh, sites that, that existed uh, any time in prehistory, um, occupied great houses that were occupied for two to three centuries, which is just a remarkable contrast with so many sites that were lived in for maybe 50, 75 years at most, and, and, and then people moved on. People stayed in Chaco, at least some people did for centuries, you know, or their descendants for, for centuries. Um, this is a quote from um, Lynn Sebastian, who I, I admire tremendously. In the early 21st century, um, Steve Lexon led a Chaco synthesis project. And this is a quote from one of Lynn's chapters in that book, um, where I think she expresses a sentiment that I would still say is true today, that during the past 100 years, and especially in the past 30, we've gained much descriptive knowledge about what Chaco was. We know much about their challenging, challenging environment. Um, but to, to get to the key point, but when it comes to explaining how and why all of this came about, how Chaco society was organized, how it functioned. Sometimes we, we seem no further along than when the Chaco project started more than 30 years ago. Now, things have definitely changed in the last 25 years, uh, 20, 25 years, but um, it's still the case, I think, that there's no consensus view of Chaco you talk to a dozen different Chaco scholars and you're gonna get a variety of viewpoints. Um, 
and it, you know, in some ways, um, you know, you could look on that and, and say it's unfortunate. On the other hand, it's also continues to make the area exciting. Chaco is big, it is complex. It's thus not surprising that it's taken that it's taking time for us to really understand what happened there. So um, it, in short, I think in a lot of ways, we're still uh, today where, where Lynn was expressing the view uh, back in two, 2006 that, you know, we're, we still have a, a long way to go and to understand Chaco. Um, to give you some specifics, there, there's still some key issues that people debate about the extent of social, political, and ritual hierarchy and differentiation, key social, political, and re religious organizations, how important were lineages, moieties, sodalities, other units, um, what was the population of the canyon and in individual great houses. That's a particular one that will draw a lot of disagreement. Same with agricultural productivity in Chaco Canyon. Um, Gwen's book will make a very strong case that Chaco was a productive location, um, but others have argued quite strongly that it, that it was not. Um, so I won't go over, over all these, but as you can see, there's just any number of other, any number of really key fundamental issues that you would think some would, would be resolved, um, but I think it, it, it's fair to say that most of them have not. Some people certainly have answers, um, other people disagree with them. Um, in a lot of ways, that's the nature of archeology. span Now I'm gonna highlight four different things tonight, or four main issues, and these are, you know, related to each other, but they're also um, somewhat different. So I'm going to talk about the importance of understanding the history of research in the area uh, and the archival information that's available. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about the variation when we use categories like great house or outlier. Um, those kind of categories can imply uniformity. Um, and in reality, great houses differ incredibly um, from very small to very large. Um, I want to talk about understanding temporal variation within Chaco. Uh, as I mentioned a minute ago, it's really one of the few areas where you can talk about sites like Pueblo Benito or Penasco Blanco that were probably occupied for um, three centuries or more. Uh, and there's, you know, until the historic period, there's just no other sites in the Southwest public sites that, you know, are comparable. Um, and, and then finally, I want to talk about the valuable information that can still be gained, um, not by new excavations, but from analyzing collections, in many cases from excavations, uh, that were completed over a century ago. So to go over the, a little bit of the history of research in the canyon, which many of you I hope are, are familiar with, the first major uh, project in the canyon was the Hyde Exploring Expedition that ran from 1896 to 1901. Now, the standard story about the Hyde Exploring Expedition is that Richard Wetherill ran it and was responsible for most of the results. Uh, Richard Wetherill is, oops, sorry about that. Let me back up. Richard Wetherill is in the circle on the left here. Um, he was a, a rancher from Southwestern Colorado, but had several years of archeological experience in the Southwest. The person who is nominally often regarded as nominally the head of the project was George Pepper, who I've circled on the right. Um, he was almost half of Wetherill's age. He had no archeological experience in the Southwest. And for that reason, he's often regarded as having been pretty insignificant in what happened there. But in reality, 
a, a lot of what we know about the Hyde expedition, what was done, what was found, um, and in some cases, some extraordinary records are really a result of, of Pepper, not of Wetherill. What, you know, the project couldn't have been done without Wetherill, but we wouldn't know what we know today if it hadn't been for Pepper. The second major project was the National Geographic Expedition from 1920 to 27, um, led by Neil Judd, who had been a circle in the middle. Um, between these two projects, they excavated most of Pueblo Benito. Um, and that's important in a variety of ways, but one of which is simply that there's no other uh, great house in the canyon that is anywhere near uh, as, you know, excavated as much as Pueblo Benito. So we talk about Pueblo Benito a lot because we have information from the entire Pueblo. Um, in some ways that's, in most ways that's very good, um, but as I'll note in a minute, there's some problems with that as well. Now, a lot of the objects that you often see when people talk about Chaco, the, you know, some really exquisite and amazing ornaments were recovered either by the Hyde Exploring Expedition or uh, the National Geographic Expedition. So you have this jet frog with inlaid turquoise, you have a, uh, a shell with inlaid jet and inlaid turquoise. Uh, you have a cylinder vessel, a, a wicket cylinder vessel with a turquoise mosaic, uh, four abalone shells with a conch shell trumpet was actually found sitting in the, the uh, abalone shell and about a half, about two dozen glycemer shell bracelets. Um, these were all found um, by George Pepper in, 19, in 1896. And they probably date between about 775 and 850. Although, as with many things, there's, a, there's debate about that. And then there's the cylinder vessels that are well known from Chaco as well. These are the vessels that Patty Crown has studied and shown that they were used uh, to mix a, a cacao-based drink. Um, the, these vessels are uh, highly unusual, if and highly, you know, highly unusual in the Pueblo Southwest. You, you really find them almost exclusively in Chaco, and in Chaco, they're almost all from Pueblo Benito. Um, so, you know, just some examples of some of the extraordinary things that have been recovered from Pueblo Benito. Now, I'm going to talk about a set of rooms um, in the northern part of Pueblo Benito briefly. There, there are actually two burial clusters in Benito, one in the north, one in the west. I'm not going to talk about the burials um, or, you know, even really say much more other than they were burials. But um, these, sorry, oops. Okay, every time I move my mouse, it uh, has, causes problems. This set of five rooms, it, it, you know, in some ways tells the story of, of, of uh, aspects of, key aspects of Pueblo Benito. Three, three rooms, 28, 32, and 33 were excavated by Pepper in 1896. Room 28 um, did not have its roof intact. Um, it was excavated largely by George Pepper after the cylinder vessels was found. Um, once he completed the excavation of that room, he moved into 32, which had, there's a doorway between 28 and 32 that was blocked. Uh, he and Wetherill pulled the stone out, Pepper crawled through the doorway into room 32, which was full of sand. And room 32 actually still had an intact roof on it. Um, 
Again, Pit Pepper uh, excavated 30 room, 32 by candlelight. Um, and once he was uh, finished there, he dropped into room 33. And I, I, I mean, literally he dropped into 33, went through the door stupidly head first um, and found out that the floor of, or the upper surface of room 33 was not as high as he thought. Um, rooms 53 and 56, on the other hand, um, I believe were roofed, but it's not clear. They were excavated by Warren Moorhead uh, in the winter of 1896-97. So bottom line, we have great information on rooms 28, 32, and 33 that had valuable information in we have much less information on rooms 53 and 56 because Moorhead basically went through Chaco in a couple of weeks, um, was only interested in collecting skulls and uh, museum items from museum collections. Um, and he later advertised uh, in the Antiquarian uh, to sell half of his collection as well as his field notes. And his field notes are, no one, no one knows where they are today. But fortunately, we do have uh, notes from both, uh, from Pepper's excavation. So here's an example of a notebook of, that describes day by day his, room, his excavations of room 32 and 33. So I'm showing you this simply because a lot of people talk about these early excavations and dismiss them and say, well, we really just don't have adequate information. Um, and that's, that's definitely true of some of the rooms that were excavated, as is the case with Moorheads. But at the same time, um, there are some rooms, uh, many of which were excavated in 1896, that we have great information on. So just zoom in on this notebook and then turn inside. And this is Pepper's description, for example, of the stratigraphy in room 33. So in 1896, long before a lot of people were actually recording information about stratigraphy, Pepper's making detailed notes about it uh, and leaving that valuable information for us today. Um, now, as Paul said, one of the things that we that um, I've worked on uh, with you know, about 30 other people, particularly Carrie Heidman, uh, is the construction of the, the Chaco Research Archive. And one of the things we've done is to go back to some of these early excavations, uh, particularly the Hyde Exploring Expedition and the National Geographic Expedition, and try and gather together all the photos, all the notes, um, any, any kind of records relevant to it, and we've created a database that ties individual photos, individual notes to rooms in, in Pueblo Benito or, or a range of other sites in Chaco Canyon. So again, and the key point here is there's an incredible archival record of Chaco that I think we still don't take uh, advantage of adequately enough. Um, uh, and, and it's simply there for the taking. Okay, returning to the, to the map of the, the canyon. Uh, as I mentioned, when we talk about great houses, you know, they truly are remarkable. The masonry, you don't, you know, you only find it outliers outside the canyon, move over river to Black Mesa, move to um, Chevron, moved to a lot of areas of the Southwest, and you just don't see the incredible construction of great houses with walls that are two and three feet thick, and, and in some cases, four and five stories high. But one of the things I think it's important to remember is that how much these great houses vary among each other. So, oops, okay. So this is a, a, a drawing from Steve Lexon's great book, Great Pueblo Architecture, uh, that shows you some of the differences of the scale of the sites. Uh, Benito is one of the largest, Penasco Blanco uh, is similarly large, Chacho Kettle, uh, another large one, 
But then you have some incredibly tiny sites like New Alto, Casa Chiquita, Quinclazo, and then some in between like Pueblo del Arroyo, Hongo Pavi, um, you know. Most of these sites, if they've been excavated, have only, um, only small parts of them have been. Uh, Del Arroyo was certainly excavated by, by Judd during the time uh, he was working at Benito. Uh, Pueblo Alto was a focus of the National Park Service project uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, and Chatham Kettle was excavated um, by the UNM Field School um, in, in, in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, but, um, you know, ideally, in the best of all possible worlds, you'd like to have comparative information, at least some comparative information from, from at least some, some of it from all of these sites. So again, there's, there's remarkable variation in scale and in, in, in size. Um, there's limited testing, say, at, at Unabita. Um, and Pueblo Benito is the only site that's been completely excavated. And it's one of the reasons why when you open almost any article about Chaco and they're talking about great houses in the canyon, they focus on Benito. Um, now, the other thing that Gwen Vivian would have been mad, would be mad if I didn't mention is that certainly great houses were not the only sites in Chaco Canyon. There are literally hundreds of small house sites, um, you know, all through the canyon uh, where any, you know, estimates have ranged from, uh, for the canyon as a whole, have ranged from 2,000 to 5,000. I think most people today are 2,000 or lower. Um, but, you know, it was not just the great houses in, in Chaco. But um, Pueblo Benito undoubtedly gets our, our attention because of how much we know about it. Um, and it truly is an exquisite site, as Neil Judd described for the National Geographic Society in 1920. Um, on the other hand, again, one of the things that Gwen would be jabbing me in the ribs and saying is, are you talking about Pueblo Benito again? You know, there's definitely a, a strong Pueblo Benito bias. That a lot of the things that I've shown you, the, the amount of shell, the turquoise, um, you know, the, the cylinder vessels, um, and I'll cover this in a little more detail a, a little bit later, you, you actually don't find that, that much at other Chaco great houses. So when, you, when we do talk about Benito, you have to keep in mind that it is in a lot of ways one in kind, one of the kind. Um, and um, as I said, we'd like to have more information about some of the other sites, but we have incredibly good information about Benito. So, you know, I often hear people refer to, to Benito as a planned site. And one of the things I simply want to emphasize is that Benito is a, is a great house that was built through fits and starts and with major sections of the Pueblo built and then torn to the ground and then other rooms rebuilt on top of them. Uh, there's a this north, what's called the Northeastern Foundation Complex in yellow that heads off to the, to the right side of Benito that Neil Judd found when he was trying to find the, the Pueblo Benito, Benito Cemetery. Uh, I was doing testing around the area and it came on, came upon the Northeastern Foundation Complex. Um, but the complex never seems to have been finished. Um, it's still unclear exactly what it was, what it was intended to be, um, but it's there. And it's an example of the fact of how much time Chacoans would invest in architecture and then say, 
Well, maybe not. This is what we want. If you look at the Pueblo itself, um, it's the area in red that's the, the early core of Benito. Um, and again, within that core, there's multiple building stages. So this is glossing over. This is a map that's really the, from Neil Judd. Uh, it's glossing over some of the variation, but you have the, the core of very irregularly shaped rooms in the north, and then wings of much bigger regular sh shaped rooms uh, to the west uh, and to the east, although the east rooms were, were some of those that were knocked down and other rooms built on top. So the red is first, the purple gets added after that, the green rooms after that, and the brown after that. So So Benito ends up looking very planned and very regular, but during its history, it was far from it. Um, and at any given time, Benito looked quite different from what we see today. And I think that's one of the things that we need to keep in mind um, when we talk about the history of Benito, talk about the history of the canyon uh, and so on. Now, it's these rooms up that, that I've highlighted uh, in the northern part of the Pueblo that I think are truly the earliest. Um, at least that's what Judd thought. Other people, I think, have concluded similarly. Um, Tom Wines, I know, has, um, has divisions within this area um, for different building stages. But um, I think most people would agree that these are some of the earliest rooms built at the site. Uh, and it's actually, these rooms are also where most of the, the unusual artifacts occur. The cylinder vessels, much of the turquoise, much of the shell, the scarlet macaws, uh, a lot of the scarlet macaws that have been recovered from Chaco Canyon that I'll talk again about, about briefly. Um, so even those rooms are early, they remain significant throughout the history of, of Pueblo Benito. Um, and I think the collections from those rooms uh, are, are truly incredible. Now, um, <clears throat> to move on, to talk about temporal variation in Chaco, a lot what a, a lot of people focus on in their discussion is this period from 1030 to 1130 CE. Um, as I'll show you just in a minute, uh, uh, there was a tremendous amount of construction during that century. Uh, a lot of the great houses were built or expanded during that period. Um, and Jim Judge, back in an article, he that was published in, in 2004, refers to these 100 years as Chaco's golden century. Um, other people have referred to them as the Chaco phenomena, the Chaco fluorescence, um, and a variety of other terms. But um, the golden century is, is meant to refer to not simply great houses, but potentially the construction of irrigation systems, the acquisition of turquoise, uh, the acquisition of the scarlet macaws, much of the shell, uh, the crafting of the remarkable ornaments, the cylinder vessels, and so forth. Um, and there's, there are two unusual burials beneath a, uh, a wooden plank, wooden floor in room 33. Um, and those are also often dated to this century of time. So I'm gonna focus on this, this period briefly. Now, this is simply a graph of the cutting, the, 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 the uh, tree ring dates from Pueblo Benito. Um, and I should note that the scale on the y-axis is, is uh, um, a log scale, logarithmic scale, and so, if this was a arithmetic scale, you, these peaks would be much higher than they, they show here. 
but in order to compress it into a single graph, we decided to go to a logarithmic scale. But you can see there's a, essentially a construction interval around 850 to 870. Um, these are five each. Um, these are five-year intervals. Uh, there was another set of uh, interval construction from say 995 to um, 940, 950, um, and then the the significant construction that occurred from 1030 to 1130. Some people would actually move it back to 1020 or 10. 1010, um, but it's that mode of uh, that um, cluster of tree ring dates on the right uh, that is that makes up essentially Chaco's golden century. Um, and, um, you know, I think one of the things that that essentially I'm um, I want to say over the next few minutes is these triggering dates are tremendous. I mean, any other place in the Southwest, you would love to have uh, this number of triggering dates. So they're incredible in developing a chronology. On the other hand, they're not the whole story. And I think we sometimes assume they do tell us the whole story. Uh, and so I want to talk about that a bit. Um, when, when Pepper and Weatherill arrived in the canyon and began excavation in 1896, one of the things uh, that occurred was that a lot of the rooms that they excavated, and I've talked about rooms 32 and 33 already um, that were roofed um, and had significant overburden above them, uh, this is a photo of two of, of the Navajo workers that, that they had hired who are working in one of these underground rooms as well. Um, you know, no one would go into a room like this today and, and try and do any excavations given the tremendous amount of overburden above them, which, may, which is, consists of uh, the masonry and the roofs from second, third, fourth story story structures um, above them. But this is a nice example of how deeply buried many of these site, many of these rooms are. Um, they're also, they're still deeply buried today. When you take the path, the, the, walk the path through Pueblo Menino, if you've done that before, uh, and you go through the Northern set of rooms, you're walking through generally rooms that are at the second uh, story level. Uh, you're well above the first story rooms, which are, uh, again, buried today. They've been backfilled. They're, they're largely inaccessible, except for a small number that you can get to through a, 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 a gate that the Park Service keeps locked. Um, but I mentioned these rooms simply because they are not well dated by dendrochronology. So we don't have great tree ring dates from them. And in order to understand the chronology of these rooms, I think, you know, we have to turn to other kinds of dating methods. So again, I'm going to talk a, a, a bit about this same set of rooms again, um, that, you know, room, room 28, um, is, is actually a very complex room. Uh, Patty Crown's got a great book on it called The House of the Cylinder Vessels. Um, she has re-excavated it and can tell you much more in, about it uh, in, a, in superb fashion in her book. Um, 32 and 33 are, are really key rooms um, in part because 33 is this, um, complex mortuary crypt with um, 14 individuals that are buried in it. Um, something that, uh, that I know of, there's no parallel as far as I know anywhere else in the Southwest. So if we're gonna have any chance of dating some of the, these rooms, um, I felt and that, that we have to turn uh, to radiocarbon dates in order to 
not replace the dead the tree root record, but to complement it. So I'm going to focus on two types of materials quickly uh, to finish up. Um, on the one hand, I'm going to talk about the turquoise, um, which is so common in, in Pueblo Benito, over 50,000 pieces of turquoise uh, from Benito alone. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the scarlet macaws that occur, you know, there's um, about, I think, 42 macaws from Pueblo Benito, or 42 actually from Chaco Canyon, um, a, a slightly smaller number or in, in the high 30s from Benito itself. Um, and again, um, I think understanding what are the dates of these artifacts? When, when was, is this part of the golden century? Does all this turquoise date to that period? Does the, do the macaws all date to this golden century or might they date to another period? So here's a, a, a simple count simply to show you the variation of the number of pieces of turquoise um, in, in both in different in, in rooms and in the first two rows, um, first three rows, and then in two other uh, Chaco and Great Houses. So room 33, which is the mortuary, uh, the mortuary crypt at Benito, has over 50,000 pieces of turquoise. Now, I haven't counted them, but Jill Neitzel has. And so I'm relying on her, her, her statistics here. Um, the two individuals that are, that are buried beneath the wooden floor in room 33 are accompanied by over 45,000 pieces of turquoise. Room 53, which is north uh, of room 33, has approximately 4,000 pieces of turquoise, according to Neitzel. And then contrast that with Pueblo del Arroyo, that has fewer than 200 pieces of turquoise. Uh, Judd notes in 1959 in one of his monographs, turquoise was cons conspicuously lacking at, at, at Pueblo de Arroyo. And then in Joan Mathian's tally of turquoise at, at Pueblo Alto, um, they're approximately 278. So Arroyo, and Alto date during, were built largely during what is referred to as the golden century. Rooms 53 th and 33 in Pueblo Benito largely predate that period. So here's a case where massive amounts of turquoise, first of all, do not occur during the golden century. They occur before it. Um, and in addition, they don't occur, massive amounts of turquoise don't occur at all great houses. In fact, it seems to be only Benito, as far as we know so far, uh, that has significant, uh, this, this massive amount of turquoise. It, it, if I had to guess if there's any other site in the canyon that, has, that is comparable to Benito, it might be Penasco Blanco. Um, which has never been excavated and probably never will. Um, it, you know, it's, it's equally early as Benito, it's large, uh, it definitely has early architecture. Um, Neil Judd had actually put in, started to put in a permit in 1928 uh, to excavate it after he finished working at Pueblo uh, Benito, but he decided he better not that he had far too much to write up already. Now, looking at scarlet macaws, there's a similar picture. Uh, at Pueblo Benito, you have 32 that, are, that we can definitely say, or this is actually from Kate Bishop's dissertation um, that was completed in 2019. Um, 32 scarlet macaws, three macaws that can be identified as the species two thick-billed parrots. So a total of 37 parrots of some type. At Pueblo de Arroyo, 
where Judd did a, you know, it was not completely excavated, but Judd did a lot of excavation. There are four. Kincletso, one. Pueblo Alto, none. Chacho Kettle, none. Unavida, one. And then one small house site that has a scarlet macaw. So again, like the, like the turquoise, and I would guess also probably like the shell, um, Pueblo Benito does stand out. So it may have been the, maybe the only site that we know well because it's completely excavated, but based on what we know from other sites where excavation has occurred, like Arroyo and Pueblo Alto and Quinclazo, Benito is highly unusual uh, and has a remarkable frequency of uh, scarlet macaws. So one of the things that, that we've worked on in order to complement the triggering dates is to do some radiocarbon dating of various materials from different parts of, of Chaco. Um, some of them have been small rodents, um, some of them have been macaws uh, and some you know, other material. And what this pink area is, is marking is the peak of the acquisition of scarlet macaws, as well as the peak occurrence uh, of the, the tree ring dates or, or the period when most of the tree ring dates fall. And again, it's really not during this golden century. Uh, it, uh, well, it overlaps a little bit, but it largely proceeds in dates from about 990 uh, to 1040. Um, now, if you go to um, look at this graph again, here's the golden century marked out, 1030 to 1130, according to Judd. This is where I would place most of the turquoise, um, but based on uh, radiocarbon dates, based on other evidence, um, some of the, the studies, for example, that Tom Wines has done, at small sites where there appear to be uh, work workshops where they're produce producing turquoise jewelry. Um, my guess is most of the turquoise in, in Chaco was deposited between about 800 and 950. Doesn't mean all of it. There was definitely turquoise uh, still coming into Chaco, still being made into ornaments later on. But I think the bulk of it falls during this early period. And then here's where the macaws fall. So my basic point is the temporal history of Chaco, of Chaco Canyon is much more complex than I think a lot of people have uh, acknowledged. Um, there undoubtedly was a massive building uh, episode from 1030 to 1130 during what's called the golden century. But some of the other key, key characteristics that have been used to define that golden century, turquoise and macaws being, being two of them, don't really occur that much during the golden century. So we have turquoise very early, I think probably very significant perhaps in the establishment of social hierarchy and social differentiation in the canyon. Then later on, you get macaws coming in. Um, from um, uh, you know, somewhere in Northern Mexico. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, very briefly in a minute. Um, and then you get the, the construction episode. So if we're gonna understand Chaco, we can't just focus on construction and architecture. We have to understand the dating of other materials, uh, their distribution, not only within sites, uh, but between sites, um, and I think that's, that's not an easy task, um, but I think it's an incredibly interesting and challenging one. So again, just to add a little bit more information about Scarlet because, and because it's become an area of interest of mine, this is a natural distribution of Scarlet Macaws in Mexico and Central America at the end of uh, the 19th century. So a long way 
from the American Southwest. Uh, a long way from Chaco, um, the areas in gray, this is an illustration by Chris Swartz. The, the macaws only tend to occur in large numbers in certain areas, Chaco, Membrace, which is contemporaneous with Chaco, uh, Wapaki in the Flagstaff area, some in Southern Arizona, um, some in the Muggyu and Highlands uh, of Arizona, uh, and then, of course, Costas Grande is much later in time. Now, in addition to um, the radiocarbon dating, one of the things we've done is to uh, begin to do some DNA analysis of some of the macaws. Um, this, this is a, a graph from an article of the re reference that's over on the right. It's an article that was published in 2018. It includes uh, a macaw from the Mitchell site, which is in the Mimbris area in southwestern New Mexico, it's a macaw from Wind Mountain, also a Mimbris area, and then down at the bottom, Old Town, which is also Mimbris area. Um, and then the macaws from uh, Pueblo del Arroyo and Pueblo Benito in Chaco Canyon. Now, when we began this work, we had no idea what we were going to find. Um, and the result was actually quite remarkable because every macaw that has been analyzed so far uh, belongs to the same haplogroup, same basic genetic group that's referred to as haplo6 here. Uh, there's variations within it, haplo6a1, a2, a3, A4, but essentially th these are birds that are all descended from the same genetic group. Um, and what we're coming to conclude uh, is given this, all of the, these sites, all of these macaws um, are well before the occupation of, of Pakime, where it appears that macaws were bred, it's now appearing that there were Chaco era, Mimbris area, era um, sites either in southern Arizona uh, or I think more, more likely somewhere in northern or northeastern um, Mexico that were that had breeding colonies of macaws similar to what um, has been found at Pakime. So this is uh, where you know some of some of the recent research that I've been involved in is, is heading uh, and to give a plug, well, okay, just highlighting the genetic similarity here and then moving on to give a plug to a book that uh, I co-edited co with Chris Wartz and Pat Gilman that just came out about a month ago, um, Birds of the Sun, which has chapters on macaws from uh, all these different areas of the Southwest, from, talks about macaws in Mexico, discusses the historic significance of macaws to Pueblo people. Um, and, and I think is, I hope, is a very valuable resource. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, talked a little bit longer than I planned on uh, and apologize for that. Um, but I will, as I said, I will end it there. Thank you, Steve. Do you, uh, would you like to, oh, right. <clears throat> you can stop your screen share. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I do have questions already, so I think we'll just dive right into those. Um, and I, I've seen a bunch of them about the turquoise, so let's just start there. <clears throat> Do you know where the turquoise comes from to start with? Um, Allison Thibodeau from the University of Arizona has written a dissertation on uh, that talks about, about where, where a lot of the Chaco uh, turquoise is coming from. Certainly, um, you know, a, a significant amount is coming from Cerrillos, which is still a 
uh, a major source for, for public groups, but there are turquoise sources that, you know, throughout the Southwest in Utah, uh, Nevada, um, Arizona. So, you know, turquoise is coming from, from multiple areas, whereas I think people once thought it probably all came from Cerritos and it may still be the case that it's, a, you know, the, the you know, Cerritos provided more than any other source. Um, it, there's definitely, a, you know, a number of sources and, and I would refer you to Alison Thibodeau's dissertation as well as some research that Joan Mathian uh, and colleagues have done on turquoise sourcing as well that is equally important. Okay, good. Um, there is a question about um, the turquoise that was buried with the bodies and um, are there pieces that help identify their significance, the people's significance that were buried with that turquoise? Um, so, well, okay, there, um, there, the, what comes to mind, there are the two individuals who I've mentioned, um, who are buried in room 33, uh, in a mortuary crypt. Uh, there's 14 individuals in the room overall. Um, there was one individual buried at, at, at the bottom of the floor on a layer of of uh, charcoal and yellow sand uh, that uh, and then and, and that individual was accompanied by probably 45,000 of the pieces of turquoise. There's another individual who's buried um, after the, the lowest individual is, is, is interred a lot of clean sand looks like it's brought into, into the, to the room. Uh, another individual's buried. That individual also has a lot of turquoise and shell, um, not as much as the lower one, uh, but a significant amount. And then the wooden floor is laid across the room. And then there's 12 other individuals buried above it. So, um, you know, you can't date the turquoise directly. Um, but I think the, 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 num the amount of turquoise, um, and like I said, there's the tur that, uh, wicker cylinder vessel that's covered with a turquoise mosaic, um, that was associated with the, the individual, uh, at the bottom of the, the crypt. Uh, there was actually another, a second cylinder vessel that had alternating layers of turquoise and shell that fell apart when Pepper excavated it. Um, so it's still not preserved. I mean, they were actually able to bring part of the, the uh, turquoise mosaic covered one back, although to a large extent it's reconstructed. Um, but um, again, you know, it, the, the amount of turquoise and shell with those two individuals, um, you know, I think, as I said, I think definitely speaks to their importance and perhaps the early establishment of social hierarchy and social differentiation um, in Chaco Canyon. Um, I mean, individual pieces, um, I think each, each of those individuals had tur turquoise anklets, turquoise necklets, necklaces, the necklaces had turquoise pendants. Um, you know, there were also, you know, shell, the shell bracelets that I showed. Um, and, and those are unparalleled, as far as I know, anywhere in the, in the Chaco world. Um, Judd found one uh, turquoise necklace in the other um, burial cluster in Pueblo Benito. I don't believe it was associated with any specific burial. It was found beneath the floor. Um, my inference from Judd's notes is that he was, he went in thinking he was going to find a lot of turquoise and shell like Pepper and Wetherill did, uh, and he didn't. And when he finally came upon what was actually a, a 
well-preserved, complete turquoise necklace. He was thrilled to actually finally get some. Okay, uh, let's see what else we have. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about if there's a link between Chaco and Pakime, just briefly? Um, briefly, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, I've definitely read Steve Lexon's argument um, about the meridian. Um, I have no doubt about the connection between Chaco and um, Solomon and Aztec to the north. Uh, I, you know, I think most most Chaco scholars agree that that's a very strong connection in Chaco and and Salmon Ruin and Aztec Ruin, some of the other great houses up in the Farmington, Bloomfield, Aztec area. Um, there's definitely a, a very strong relationship. Um, perhaps Masons from Chaco Canyon actually coming up and, and helping to build some of those structures. Um, but there's a, there's a big gap between, a big temporal gap between um, Chaco and, and uh, Pocky May. Um, it's not as big as I once thought, because again, as we've you know done some of the radiocarbon dating, we're getting some dates that fall in the late 1100s and close to 1200, uh, which I hadn't really anticipated that we would get. Some of them cause actually seem to date to that period, which is, I think, particularly interesting. Um, but Pocky May is just different from Chaco in so many ways. Um, you know, uh, pottery, you know, the rooms, the, the, the ritual structures. Um, you know, Paul Minnis can, can give you more detail than I can, but uh, I, I really just don't see uh, a connection between Chaco and Pocky May. I think there's a much the connection between Chaco is to the, you know, the Karis Pueblos, the, the Hopi, uh, the Rio Grande Pueblos. Um, when people left Chaco, I think that's where they went. Uh, it's certainly possible if you could have gone uh, to Northern Mexico, but I don't see a major movement. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to stay with macaws for a second. Um, would you interpret the large number of macaws in Puebla Bonito prior to 1050 to indicate that the birds were being bred there and therefore much earlier than they were at Pakime? And I think you talked about that part, but um, were they being bred there earlier than down south? Most of the, uh, well, I, I should say more than most. Uh, you know, all but maybe one or two of the birds uh, from Chaco. Um, uh, died, you know, around the age of one. Um, scarlet and macaws can't breed until they're about four years old. So in order to have, you know, to, to have possibility of breeding in, in, in Chaco Canyon, you would have to have at least two and probably um, a few more than that. Um, macaws that, that are four years or, or older. Um, and there's only one of them. Um, one of the interesting things about scarlet macaws is um, even people who raise and breed them can't tell male, males from females. So it, it's not, not easy to sort of say, okay, I'm gonna take a male and a female and put them together and, and with the hopes of of breeding them and be beginning to, to establish a colony of macaws. Um, so that's why I say, I think you probably need minimally three or four. Uh, and there's just not the evidence for that in Chaco. Um, there is some, um, Pat Gilman and um, forgetting the other name have suggested that, that there might've been some breeding in the Membrus area. Um, I think that's a possibility. Um, in addition to the younger birds, I think Chaco is probably just too cold to have been uh, a breeding area for macaws. Um, 
Okay. And one more, one more macaw question, I think. Um, many of the macaws recovered from Wipatki uh, had some interesting bone pathologies. Is this common in those at Chaco as well? Uh, it's not that common. I mean, um, all the macaws were um, plucked for feathers. I mean, that was largely the reason they were acquired. So you, you definitely find uh, evidence on the bone of, of you know, feathers being plucked. Um, there, there's definitely some other pathologies, but they're not, um, you know, they're not that abundant. Uh, again, I would uh, refer you to Kate Bishop's um, dissertation, and there's another dissertation um, that's being written by a student at the University of Florida, and, and I apologize to her, I'm blanking on her name right now. Um, she's, she's focusing um, more than Kay did on pathologies. Um, but um, like I said, it, it's not, my understanding is it's not anywhere near as common at Chaco as it is um, at Uwapaki. To switch gears a little bit. Um, I've heard about astronomical knowledge at this site. Can you speak about that at all? Uh, boy, that's that's one area that I'm not particularly strong uh, on. Uh, you know, I, I mean, there's no question that people in Chaco um, you know, had detailed astronomical knowledge. I think Anna Silver and her group have established that very, very clearly. Uh, the sun dagger, um, the alignment of, of some of the, the Pueblo walls. Um, you know, there's the crescent moon down near Pen Penasco Blanco that uh, may represent a supernova. Um, so, you know, th there's probably better evidence in Chaco than, than you would find in, in most areas. Of the Southwest, um, I think that's, you know, unquestionably significant. Um, on the other hand, you know, anyone who's a good farmer is going to be knowledgeable about astronomy because you're going to be able need to be able to um, decide when it's time to plant your crops, um, and you're not going to be able to do that unless you can begin, you know, predict, predict the weather and the best way of doing that at that point would have been uh, through astronomical knowledge and mo movement of the sun um, and, and stars and the moon. All right, I'm just gonna take a couple of more um, and there are others, but um, we can talk about that in a minute. Um, in a talk given by Patty Crown, she describes how the fill in most of the rooms around room 28 uh, was highly disturbed and kind of all mixed up. Was this taken into account for the counts and would that affect the dates? Um, I think the counts, I mean, the counts for um, room 33, I, I think are pretty solid. Um, I mean, to go, to go into a little more detail, when when Pepper excavated room 32, he threw the back door into room 28. When he excavated room 33, he threw the back door into 32 and then into 28. So there's actually photos of Pepper and Wetherill sifting through these piles of sand looking for turquoise beads. Um, and while I think it's, it's you know, to Pepper, you know, found little turquoise in room 32 during this excavation. So I think it's pretty clear that, that, that the turquoise they were getting came from 33. Um, 53 and 56 are, are a whole different uh, situation because uh, as I mentioned, they were excavated by Warren Moorhead during the winter of 1896 and 19, 1897. Um, the only information we have on him is from when Pepper returned to the, the canyon in the, in the spring of 1897. 
uh, and found somewhat to his horror what Moore had it done to those rooms. Um, you know, he'd thrown skeletal parts um, again from 53 and from 56 into 53. Um, I'm sure there was turquoise and other material that was also thrown. Uh, so I would, I would be less confident of room, say the counts from room 53, um, but I would be much more confident of saying it was the, the, the turquoise, the tur number of turquoise uh, pieces that I gave you um, and that Jill Knights would count it from room 33. If they weren't from, from 53, if they weren't from 53, they were from 56. Uh, which is contiguous to it. And both rooms are, are just north of rooms 32, 33 and 32. Um, you know, Moore had excavated burials in, in room 56. He left uh, other burials un, unexcavated. Um, from what Pepper was able to determine, there were some really interesting, unique features in those rooms that we just, you know, I'd love, uh, you know, we'd love to know more about it, but, um, you know, whereas in, in room 33, we can often say, I mean, in room 33, Pepper actually plotted the location of a lot of the uh, material three-dimensionally. Uh, so you can actually place it exactly where it was in the room which is virtually unheard of in the Southwest, even today. Um, so, you know, the, we have incredible, incredibly detailed information, but it's the total other end of the continuum in, in rooms 53 and 56. So, I, you know, I know there's a, a double cylinder vessel that came from, I think, either room 53 or 56, and Patty found one of the shirts from it in room 28 went during her excavations. So um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think by the time Pepper returned in 1897, the roof, the roofs, roof of room 32 had been destroyed by Moorhead. So it would have been pretty easy to throw the back dirt from room 56 and 53 into 28. So yeah, no question, it was highly disturbed. Um, but the counts I'm most confident about are the ones from 33. Thanks for that. All right, I'm just going to take one more because I know it's about 11.15 your time. <laughs> um, and uh, to those of you, if your questions didn't get answered and you are um, really wanting to hear what Steve has to say about them, you are welcome to email the ARC and HIST website. You'll get that um, email address in the follow-up letter uh, email that you get from this lecture. So um, if, if you really want your question answered, you're welcome to put it into that Ark and His email address, and then we will get them to Steve, because uh, there are just a few more that were not answered. But let's take one more. In your estimation, would the online Chaco Research Archive be open to adding the extensive rock art documentation data that have been systematic collected, systematically collected throughout the park over the last 25 years? Uh, it would be great to add that. Um, you know, I, I, I know, uh, you know, Jane Colber had been doing surveys of the rock art um, and they had notebooks of some of the slides uh, as, as well as some of her documentation in the canyon when we were going through our various stages of work, focusing mostly on the sites. Um, and I kept looking at those notebooks thinking, geez, it would be nice to scan those and, and get those into the archive as well. Um, so, you know, I'm retired and although, you know, I began work on the archive with Kerry Heidman and Abby Holman primarily uh, and Worthy Martin uh, at the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities at UVA. Kerry is now the one responsible. Uh, I'm not trying to shift the burden to her, but um, you know, to, to accomplish what we did 
require two sizable grants from the Andrew Mellon Foundation that together came to a little more than a million dollars. So uh, to add the rock art would be wonderful, but um, I think it would only be feasible um, by going out and again, trying to, to secure some significant grant money um, to do it or for someone with uh, a lot of eager students uh, who would be willing to scan slides and uh, scan documents. Uh, and, you know, once, once the scanning is done, which is the hard part, um, it's a little quicker to get it into the database. All right, thank you so much. Um, thank you particularly for being on this late in the evening. Uh, we, we appreciate your sharing with us. And um, to those of you out there who didn't get your questions answered or you have comments in the chats, those will get forwarded to Steve. But if you have a question that you really want answered, uh, please put that in our Arkenhis email and we will forward them as, as we can, okay? Uh, so thank you, Steve, so much. Any last comments? No, thank you for in inviting me. Uh, I appreciate it. I always enjoy talking about Chaco. Um, I'm, I'm glad I didn't go much over what I <laughs> planned. Um, you know, Chaco is just a fascinating place and it's easy to keep talking on and on about it. So um, I appreciate everyone listening. Um, I'm happy for any feedback uh, and I appreciate the invitation to uh, give the talk tonight. Thank you, thank you. We are so honored that you took the time to do this for us. And um, again, I will share the comments that are coming through. There's some very nice comments coming through, but I'll send you a, a written version, a text version of that. So, um, all right, thank you everyone. Thanks for being here. And we'll see you again next month. Some of you in person, perhaps, that would be awesome. Uh, and the rest of you will be on Zoom again next month. So. Um, I think I said next year. Sorry, I meant next month. <laughs> anyway, have a good evening and we will see you soon. Thanks, Fred. Bye.